Hey, this is the innovator Bonds, Tommy Dream, and you're listening to Strike Zone in Rhode Island, taking you to the extreme. We have the- Kenny Dykstra on the line. Woo! All right. Hey. Former, member Former Spirit, Spirit Squad, squad member. Right, hey! Welcome to the show, Kenny. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for calling in. We appreciate it. We greatly appreciate it. Now, Kenny, first thing, uh, we're going to go uh, backtrack a little bit. I know Jay's uh, d- done some research on your career, and I've certainly followed your career. I saw your match most recently, Kenny, in XWA, where you and Mike Mondo were working more of a babyface style. And I got to say, I was really impressed because the Spirit Squad gimmick was primarily a heel gimmick, primarily designed to be a heel gimmick with being male cheerleaders. And I think you guys did a great job of really getting over and getting a great reaction. I thought you guys got one of the better reactions of the night at XWA, which had a lot of stars on that card. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know what's weird is sometimes we'll do shows and, well, we never know what we're going to be. Like, there was one show, I don't even remember when it was, but we were, for sure, we were going to be the heels of the show. And we came out and the crowd just popped. And I was like, I guess we're baby faces now. So... It's weird. Some some towns react differently. Although King of Trios, when I did that for Chikara, was the first night we were baby faces. Second night, nothing really changed, but they blew the heck out of us. So wow. who knows? So I mean, just go yeah. to the show. And Kenny, do do you feel like it, it's like the climate of today's wrestling fan? It's almost a borderline bipolar kind of climate. You never know what you're gonna get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even shows sometimes where I do singles matches, I don't. Sometimes they'll cheer me. Sometimes they'll boo me. I did. Uh, I did the uh, the first Evolve show. I did. They just booed the hell out of me because I just kept working a chin lock. I thought I'd be a little yeah. different. I mean, so then the, like the second wrestle, show, man. yeah, the second show I came out and they all started cheering for the chin lock. So it was weird. You never know, really. And it was the same town too. Wow, probably same exact crowd. Yeah. Now, uh, Kenny, probably so. Now, Kenny, working in front of big crowds in WWE and working more intimate crowds with Indy, um, different wrestlers, some perform working, you know, intimate crowds and the other ones bigger. What do you prefer after doing both? Uh, you know, honestly, it's hard to say because, like, the, the big crowds, I never get nervous, which I guess is a great thing because, you know, it could be sold out Madison Square Garden, and I'm, I don't get nervous at all. But small crowds, I somewhat get nervous, and I think because, like, you know, you can hear someone's opinion where if it's a loud crowd, a big crowd, one person might shout something, but it just gets muffled in and it's like a sea of people. I've always been, um, Kenny, I, this is Joe Passarelli here from the Strike Zone. I, you know, I, I've dabbled in, in uh, sports entertainment, I've dabbled in live comedy, and I've always felt it's much harder and much more nerve wracking to get a reaction from a smaller audience oh, because right. of what you just said. Yeah, and it's almost right. like it's, it's, I've heard Mick Foley okay, say I'm this sorry. in shoot interviews. I've heard other people say this. Hold it's on. so much harder to pop a 50-person crowd than a 50,000-person crowd. And if you can and kind of master the art of both, then, like, one. you're going places. Yeah, they seem more harsh on you, the smaller crowds, because they uh, they want more, I think. Yeah. Or they feel like, oh, I want to dictate the pace of your match. Like, And for me, I'm like, no, if you start, if you start like, heckling me during my match... You're going to get a very boring match. I'm just going to sit in a hold until you decide to change your attitude. And that's great psychology because that's the adapting, like like you say, you're not sure if you're going to work face or heel on a nightly basis. And if they're getting edgy like that, you might as well rack up the heat and see if you can get some shine for your opponent and just throw on a rest hold. I think that's great psychology, personally. Exactly. Plus, I don't have all that many moves. Usually... <laughs> You when I'm talking great. about a match, someone says, what do you do well? And I'm like, uh, bump and feed. I don't know. Yeah, you've always bump and fed well. That's why you worked great in the Spirit Squad. And uh, you throw a great drop kick. I always thought you threw one of the better drop kicks in the business. Thank you. You know what? I never got credit for my drop kick because Hardcore Holly was on the show, too, and his oh. was just phenomenal. Yeah. So mine kind of came in second fiddle. But leg drops... I can hold my own in a leg drop contest. Well, when you see Bob Holly, tell him the strike zone said you do a better uh, drop kick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take yeah. Kenny on this one. Jay, go ahead. And, write it on a piece of paper. I'll hand it to him. Yeah. All right. No problem. <laughs> and guys, uh, also joining us for this interview is uh, Strike Zone's own uh, Nate T. Money Grist. Uh, I know he wanted to ask uh, Kenny you a couple questions as well. Oh, well, I've like I known Ken- I know Kenny for a while. What's up, Ken? What's up, buddy? How you been? I've been good. I'll see you on March 6th. I'll be there taking photos. But just wanted to say, yeah. for anybody that doesn't know about Kenny's previous 
Wrestling has to pick up the PWF Northeast Genesis 2 DVD, one of the greatest ladder tables and cheers matches of all time. Johnny Curtis and Kenny as the Talent Exchange versus Trilogy versus Fusion was one of the best tables, ladders, and chairs match of all time, WWE or anywhere else. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was a great match. We uh, we didn't really plan too much of it. We just said, go out and don't get hurt. And it ended up working out really well. Everybody kind of gelled and played off each other. It really did. And you know what? Piggybacking off that point, I, and I've been talking about this lately on this show and other platforms, I feel like sometimes professional wrestling, especially what you see on TV, guys, it's so overly produced that they're removing the art form from it. And to have you and a guy like Johnny Curtis, for those who don't know now, Fondango, um, to, to go out there and pretty much call it in the ring and, and kind of feel for the crowd. And it goes back to what you were saying, Kenny, as well, that crowds sometimes try to dictate the pace of your match where the sign of a true veteran is being able to dictate it yourself and not allowing the crowd to frazzle you one way or the other. Exactly. And, you know, you bring up a great point, too, by saying what you see on TV is so overly produced and it really is I mean there were situations too where after I left WWE and I did some Dragon Gate and Evolve and I could really go you know yeah. and I had fans come up to me afterwards like I didn't know that you could actually like really wrestle a great match and I was like well you only see me on TV for 10 minutes doing a scripted routine I mean it's hard to you know and I always tell people too if you want to see some good stuff watch some of my old PWF or OVW stuff was really good that that they let me go and just said be you do your thing and uh, speaking right. speaking of OVW, Kenny, what was it like wrestling CM Punk in OVW? It was fun. We had a uh, really good chemistry. He was. I like working with him because nothing against the OVW guys, but a lot of them started in OVW and got the contracts through OVW, so they were all somewhat similar. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a similar training style, so you're all taught the same. So it was nice to wrestle guys that had a different background, like Punk or Albright or Chet the Jet, or Paul Birchall, guys that could come in and they had a different style from the start and they brought that with them. So you would always get something different. Punk was great because I like working with Punk because you know there's certain parts of the match where you have the advantage and you just you do your thing, you call your stuff, you call their stuff, and then at some point it's, you never really say, okay, you take over, but that person just knows to step in and take over. And Punk, you never had to, you never had to question that. He knew when to get when to take over and when to go from there and then we just you know transferred it back and forth and it, it showed really well on video as well so uh kenny out of all the wrestlers uh you work with do you feel like based on what you just said with cm punk he was the uh the best guy you had chemistry with no the greatest wrestler ever and i i'm very fortunate is mike mondo i'm fortunate uh -huh. he's my tag partner and he, will he is hands down i and i'm i'm I know that people, he gives me heat for this all the time. He's like, I'm not that great, man. And I'm like, Mondo, you are the best wrestler I've ever been in the ring with. I'm just very fortunate that you're my tag partner. So you make me better, too, you know? And that's even going against guys like Flair, Hunter, Sean, Funk, all those guys. And he Mondo will be, is hands down the best. And he will be on our show next week, so we're looking forward to having Mike Mondo on. Absolutely. And Mike, who also had time in Ring of Honor, uh, certainly a great career. I really enjoyed his time in Ring of Honor. And I heard a, a shoot interview, or, or not a shoot interview, but a podcast with Jericho and Ziggler lately, where Ziggler really credited Mondo for, uh, you know, Ziggler came in as more of a, an athlete from, from Kent State, and you guys, especially Mondo, were more of the wrestler types, and he really credited Mondo for speeding up the process of his learning curve, and I yeah, look at Ziggler yeah. to this day, still one of the best on television. And, you know, Mondo really did. Mondo, as much credit as he won't get, it's crazy it's weird because a lot of those guys up there they know i mean a lot of mondo has helped so many people and mondo he won't take any credit for it i don't think he will he, he should because he deserves it all but you tell him next week i said he's the best ever he already knows it so ask him you know what <laughs> ask mondo say kenny was on and who do you think kenny said was the best wrestler ever he might be modest and say uh rick flair or something but and so it's a great point jay go ahead and, uh, Kenny, to backtrack a little bit before OVW, um, you actually got t contacted by the WWE um, in 2001 to become um, 
a part of the company. What was that like? Uh, describe your feeling, how, um, you know, kind of your reaction when the WWE actually contacted you. Well, it was kind of weird because, like, I, I started wrestling when I was 13, and I got a ride to Stanford, and I went in and asked for an application, and they kind of laughed at me and kicked me out of the building. So I was like, oh, that was rude. Like, yeah. I didn't expect that. I was like, man, I thought I was going to be a wrestler next week. And they were like, no, you go to a training school and figure it out. And I was like, oh, God. So then that's when I found Kowalski's. And the lady, the worst thing she could have said is send us stuff and we'll critique it. So I videotaped everything. Even like me hitting the ropes, taking a bump, I videotaped it, sent it in. But then one day, like, I came home when I was a junior in high school. And my mom's like, oh, somebody from Stanford called. And I checked it. And it was Dr. Tom. And he's like, kid, how old are you? And I was like, 16. He's like, can you do math? And I was like, yeah. He's like, substitute he's like subtract two years off your date of birth he's like i need you in philly next week and then baltimore on tuesday and i was like okay i'll be there so then they just i knew that was like a somewhat of an opening and then i ended up doing the white boy challenge with rodney mack and i worked like lance storm goldust stevie richards ultimo dragon Tajiri, all these guys in dark matches and sunday night heat but everything i ended up doing ended up being on sunday night heat or something so it was pretty neat i was very fortunate and it's crazy because there were so many talented guys in that era, Kenny, who may have worked a Velocity or a Sunday Night Heat. You know, even the likes of a Samoa Joe or an AJ Styles, uh, you know, like people forget. But if you, you go back on YouTube, some of that stuff's still on there. And it's really cr crazy to see. I mean, there's a match, Brian Danielson versus John Cena from Velocity in like 2003. Yeah. Like, there's some crazy stuff on there if you go look. Yeah, and now it's like a WrestleMania match. <laughs> yeah, on, on, that's the main event of uh, SummerSlam now. And that was... Velocity yeah. 12 years ago. It's crazy to see the ebb and flow of the business. And Kenny, do you feel like nowadays the business, and especially the television, we talked about it being overproduced, do you feel like it's sorely lacking in new stars? Um, maybe, I don't, maybe not so much new stars, but uh, maybe I think they're too... How do I word this correctly? I think they control too much of it. They, they don't let guys be, guys, be themselves anymore. I've seen people come up in OVW, and I was like, man, this person's so talented. And then they just they pulled them back so much that it was like, well, if they don't really have a chance to show their talent, that's what got them to the dance, let them dance. But, you know, you can't put them in there and change the tune and tell them to do something different. Ken, have you, uh, Kenny, have you had any interest in going full-time with either Ring of Honor or TNA Wrestling? Um, I had a little bit of an experience with TNA, but... Hmm. It didn't work out well. I was just very blunt and honest with them. I I went down there, and they flew me in, and I did a dark match, and Flair put it over, and Bischoff, and all those guys were like, hey, we got to bring them in. And, and then they said, no, we want them to do another dark match. So they booked it, and then two weeks before that, they called and said, you have to fly your way down here, and you're going to work for free. And oh, I I nicely told them, look, in all due respect, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, You know, if I get hurt, then, then what? I have a full time job. I do my own thing, so I don't. I don't need that. You know, I, not to be a pain in the butt, but I don't need your free dark match. I, it's just not worth it to me. So then, literally about a week later, Dixie Carter, I we talked, and she offered me a contract worth X amount of dollars. So then I broke it down for her, and I nicely told her. I, I I said, let me call you back. So I called her back. I did all the math, and I said, listen, for what you want to pay me. If I was to be on the road full-time, I would pay for my own hotel, my own rental car my own food. By the time you pay me this low amount of money, I'm going to be taking home like 50 bucks a, a week. It's not even worth it to me. I said, no. And their response was, well, you're, you're going to get exposure on TV. I, I'd rather be off TV and be able to pay my bills. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I would rather, I don't want to be on TV homeless. And That's just awkward. And you definitely did the right thing because I heard, you know, a lot of rumors for like a year that were, you know, what, two, three, four months behind on paying their wrestlers. So yeah. it was a terrible situation there. I, I think uh, all the money went to uh, Hulk and uh, Ric Flair, all those guys it that brought terrible. in. So. In 2009, from what I've heard, the company was very profitable. I've heard that from Mick Foley and other sources who were there. Yeah. And uh, it really went downhill. They, they took a risk and they really crapped out big time. And Kenny, I think you really could have added to the depth of that roster at that point, considering the guys that were there. And, you know, you had had experience working guys like Angle, I believe, and yep. a, a few of the other guys, Jeff. And Samoa Joe. And a few of the guys AJ were Styles, there. Yeah. I mean, Joe was yeah, a I mean, one. Go ahead, Kenny. It, it was always it was, it was a great experience backstage. I mean, everybody was nice. It was a nice family atmosphere. But 
at the end of the day, it comes down. It, we are our own business. You know, I am Ken Don't Inc. You know, every, AJ Styles is AJ Styles. We are our own business within TNA, so we have to look out for our own. And if, if you're going to put me in a position where my business is going to sink because I'm working for nearly free, well, it's just financially, it's not uh, economically wise of me. And, and I always say, Kenny, life trumps the business, and, and you seem like a, an intelligent individual to know that. I mean, it's, some things just aren't worth it. you got to take the risk, uh, right risks, rather. <laughs> Jay, go ahead. <coughs> And uh, Kenny, uh, when you were part of the Spirit Squad, um, you and uh, the rest of the guys actually beat Big Show and Kane for the World Tag Team Championship on April third, two thousand six. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that experience was? Yeah, that was a great time because the night before was WrestleMania, so we had that, and then at the WrestleMania after party, you know, the writers they never want to say much, but a few of them were intoxicated and they were like. Make sure you're there tomorrow. And I'm like, why wouldn't I be there tomorrow? <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. And then they're like, is your family in town for WrestleMania? I said, yeah, my mom, I brought her in. And he's like, oh, she'll appreciate tomorrow. And I was like, what are we doing? And he's like, you're working Big Show and Kane. And I was like, we're winning the tag belts. He's like, I didn't say it. I didn't <laughs> say it. And I was like, okay. So then, like, when we did it, it was great. It was a good time. It was very, uh, you know, it was a good accomplishment. I mean, the company put the championship belt on you it means you know they see something in you guys your character i mean granted if if you really break it down to the reality of things i mean the championship belt is just in a sport like that it doesn't mean anything i mean is anybody really the champ yes and no but at the same point it just shows an investment from the company i guess so that felt good and he was heavy as heck to get up on that high spirit thing i bet Absolutely. I mean, Kenny, what, what, what a, I mean, 2006, what a crazy year it must have been. You guys debuted, I believe, what, before WrestleMania uh, to aid Vince McMahon and his feud with Shawn Michaels. DX. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and DX formed out of that, reformed out of that. You guys ended up working uh, SummerSlam, a co-main event at SummerSlam. I was there live for that. Uh, you ended up even wrestling against God at one point, from what I remember. Uh, and that's not saying Ric Flair, and you wrestled him, too. So you you got a chance to wrestle a lot of big names, including God. Yeah, God. I mean, God. He wanted to call all the shots, and he was just like, "No, you guys." He was like, "Listen, Greenhorns, I'll call the shots." He was calling. He was the general. Oh man. He had to get his stuff in. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Kenny, I have an outside of wrestling question. So I did a little research. So I guess uh, you have an anti-bullying book out. You've been uh, doing some anti-bullying campaigns. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, uh, once I got released from WWE, I was living in Virginia at the time, and there was a girl that took her own life to bullying, and I remember watching it on the news, and I was like, man, that is so harsh, like, that's crazy. So I did some research, and, you know, I've always been in education and all that stuff, and the behind the scenes of everything. I try to be very smart, I guess. So I, I found that uh, not all states had to teach about bullying, but they had to teach about reading. So I was like, well, if I write a book about it and I get it into the schools, then they'll read about bullying and essentially have to teach about it. So it's kind of like a backdoor method of trying to help out society and, you know, all the kids and stuff. Because, I mean, it gets worse as kids get older with text messaging and Facebook and Internet. And there's so many, like, keyboard warriors, I guess you would call them, that, yeah. you know, they all have something to say, but ain't nobody going to come forward and tell you they said it. So they'll be behind a closed screen and make people feel like garbage. But and a lot of it, that's where it comes from. That's what causes a lot of the bullying stuff. So, no. yeah, I was just wrote a book, and so now I do a lot of stuff with schools, and I work with uh, children that are diagnosed with autism daily. Is this uh, more locally, or is this nationwide? Do you go to different schools all over? or? Yeah, I go to schools all over. I have the same, uh, one of my writing agents, he does a lot of, he works with a lot of big name clients, so it's pretty nice. He gets me in the right areas and the right connections. And it works. It, it's really well for the kids. I follow up with the schools too, each school. I follow up with them, see how things are going, make sure that what I'm doing is actually working because if it's not working, then it's going to be pointless, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's listening, uh, well, I should say, everybody should be listening to this broadcast. <laughs> uh, where can they pick up your book? Um, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Barn at Barnes & Noble, you can get it all over. Facebook.com slash Billy's Bully. I sell it through there. There's a link on there as well. Those ones I sign. I personally sign, send them out to people. So That's fantastic. Great cause. Yep. Okay. And uh, one more question for you that's uh, 
kind of off topic from the wrestling, I saw that you were a part of the Fox reality series called Seducing Cindy, which followed uh, Cindy Margolis, who was a highly downloaded um, uh, actress. In 90, uh, like 95, number one. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, as she searched like for a new yeah. love. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about this. Oh, that was a great time. Like, they put us in this <laughs> giant mansion out in California. And at the time, I was like, uh, my agent, who does other things, different booking gigs as well, he was like, hey, I got approached about this reality thing if they knew if I knew anybody. And he's like, I thought you'd be entertaining for it. And I was like, man, I was like, they don't want me on that show. I was like, what am I going to do? So he was like, send, make a video, send it in. So I did. And then the producer called me and was like, you're a perfect fit for this. I need you. And I was like, really? So we talked it out. And then I ended up going out there and doing the whole show. And it was it was fun. It was a lot of fun. There were times, too, where, like, did you end up watching it? I, I did not have the opportunity to, no. If you get the chance to watch it, because I do a lot of pranks. Like, my thing was, I knew how producers work through WWE. Like, they want something that, you know, can go forward. So my thing on it, and... I like did a lot of research too on other reality shows. I'd watch them and I'd try to find the correlation of what keeps certain people on. So I spent many hours just studying film on this because I was like, I don't want to be that guy that goes on and gets voted off first. You know what I mean? That's, yeah, that's a waste of time. Yeah, you made so you I, made it I, all the way to the top five. I know, and there were like impressive. twenty-five people. Yeah, I felt pretty proud about that. So there was like uh, twenty-five guys and all that. So I like started writing down all these different pranks and stuff that I wanted to do. So then when it came time for the confessionals, I started talking about pranks that I was going to do. So I knew if I talked about pranks and then I did the prank and it paid off the way I wanted it to, then I could lead into another prank. And that alone would give producers the reason to go, we got to keep this guy because he's adding to the show. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's what I did. And then I ended up like, you know, somewhat cheating on some of the challenges so that way I could win. <laughs> stuff like that. So I ended up winning almost all the challenges. And some of the challenges that you see that I don't win, it's because like, like they had to refilm it because like, they took it away from me because I couldn't win every challenge. And I would find different ways to cheat, like little things. I, I didn't like I cheating mess with the, like Eddie Guerrero. <laughs> right? Oh, God, yeah. I, I, like, I, a little bit of, I stole a little bit of everybody's thing, and I used it there, and it worked perfectly. And, my, and everybody on the show was like, dude, you're going to win this. You're going to win this. And I was like, usually the guy who you think is going to win is probably not going to win it. And that's kind of what happened. But my idea was if I did win, I was going to dump her at the end and be like, you know, it takes two and you're just not for me. Sorry. <laughs> so I was going to dump her. Swerve. But it never, it never got to that point. Oh, man, that would have been great. That would have been awesome. You would have got your own show out of that, Kenny. That, that, that's a tremendous <laughs> game plan. And that's meticulously doing your homework and knowing what situation you're getting into and really getting the best out of it. You know, a reality show, a lot of people wouldn't have maybe taken that as seriously, but, I mean, that's why you had success on the show. You went out of, about it with the right approach. Now, speaking of the right approach, uh, we got to wrap things up here, but, Kenny, you're going to be live in Boston March 6th. You and Mike Mondo, the Spirit Squad. March 6th through 8th, I believe, all three days, right, Kenny? Absolutely, yeah. We'll be there all three days. Oh, wow. Now, can you talk about who you may be working, uh, or, or is, is something uh, I think we're working, I, feel, I want to say we're working the Headbangers one night. I believe that's a Sunday show, you're working the Headbangers, and I think Friday you and Mike Mondo are tag teaming, right? Yep, I believe so, yeah. So it's going to be a great show. When we work Headbangers, I think that's for the Sunday Night Heat Tag Championships. That never were. <laughs> but The Sunday Night Heat Tag Championships, that's <laughs> great. Well, Kenny, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to call in the Strike Zone. On behalf of Nate, Jay, Mike, everybody here at Team Strike Zone, we greatly appreciate it. Definitely uh, your work, I feel, was undervalued. I would have loved to see you get more of a chance in the mainstream. And I've seen you at a few independent shows, and it's always great to see you still doing your thing. And like you said, you keep things simple, but you know the psychology of things, and you know how to entertain. And that really is what keeps the people invested, and I really appreciate that. And don't forget to tell Bob Holly to call That's us at right. the Strike Zone. We'll tell him That's where right. the best drop kick is. That's right. I will. You tell him. <laughs> All right, well, Kenny, I appreciate you, you guys having me very much. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you, Kenny. We'll do it again. I'll have to be on here longer. Yes, we will definitely do it again. We'll book the rematch, brother. And we will be live, actually, at the show. You know, all three of us might not be the same day, so we'll stop by and say hello. And Nate will be there every day, too. I think. Absolutely. So Zone representation will be there every day. Please do. Thank you, guys. I look forward to seeing you. Thank and you, Thank you, Kenny. Kenny. Dykstra, formerly former WWE Tag Team Champion with the Spirit Squad. Of course, worked with some tremendous big names, and we're honored to have him here on the Strike.